Okay, so this is <coughs> the walking, talking mock for um, biology, additional biology. Um, one thing to note with biology, probably more so than the other exams, there's more stuff that's put in context and there are more questions where it's really essential that you get the keywords in. So we start off with this question um, and it's talking about the human eye, um, an organ of the nervous system. And then, first mark, just recall which structure in the eye contains light receptor cells. Okay, so we're just looking for a one word answer for that one. Um, next one, uh, and first thing you notice here, it's worth one mark, but there is a lot of information. Okay, so it's about interpreting the information. Um, the pupil reflex causes the color part of the eye, the iris, to change size. The iris contracts. Scientist shows that this reflex can be conditioned. So there's probably our first essential word. A bell was rung at the same time as the light was switched off. Eventually, the iris contracted whenever the bell was rung. Okay. Even when the light remained on. Which of the following statements about the experiment is true? We're ticking the box next to the correct statements. <sighs> One thing to notice is it says statements and then helpfully says put a tick in the box next to the correct statement so there's no clue there as to how many things you've got to tick which isn't very helpful um, if we then look at uh, the answers what you've got to do is go through process of elimination so, uh, we'll look at this one. Primary and secondary stimuli were the same. Does that make sense? The pupil reflex is a voluntary response. So, voluntary meaning that you control it. It's not automatic. Uh, the reflex response involved only motor neurons. Again, does that seem plausible? The bell stimulus was connected to a secondary stimulus. Well, that doesn't seem right because the bell stimulus was the secondary stimulus and the light stimulus was connected to a secondary stimulus. So it's about going through and working out which of those seems plausible. Um, next one. So we've got damage to the fatty sheath around neurons leading to and from the eye can cause vision problems. And again, one mark. We've got to get both of these right to get the marks. Okay. Um, complete sentences to explain this. The fact she surrounds the something of a neuron. And for that, we're going to be talking about, if you remember the fatty sheath, a neuron might look like this. Cell body at one end, connections with the other at the other end. And the fatty sheath surrounds this long projection. So we're looking for this essentially. Neurons in the optic nerve that have lost their fatty sheath will transmit nerve impulses more. So what we've got to think of is what is one of the jobs of the fatty sheath. That's what that's asking us, okay? Because they've lost their fatty sheath. Okay, so we want a comparative word there. Uh, next one, again only for one mark. It's not very generous so far. Other reflexes involve the spinal cord. In the three reflexes, the impulses travel along a spinal reflex arc. Write down two features of a spinal reflex arc that allow the response to be very fast. Okay, so, um, I mean, with this one, an example might be the knee reflex. So, what we want to think of we'll kind of go through what it means um, are things like it doesn't travel to the brain because by not travelling to the brain you're cutting out well quite a distance there um, and therefore it has a shorter distance to travel
Um, think about the number of neurons compared to the brain, like a, a, a reflex involving the brain, you, you're only going to have three neurons. You're going to have the sensory, the relay and the motor and that's it. And therefore, as well, not many synapses, so fewer synapses. Remember every time across the synapse again, it's got to. Um, it takes time. Uh, next one, this is first six marker, and this one was targeted at grades up to A star. So Rachel has an injury to her spinal cord just above her waist. She cannot walk because she cannot make her legs move. A doctor tests Rachel's knee jerk reflex and finds that it still works even though she cannot walk. Use information about the pathways followed by nerve impulses to suggest an explanation for these observations. Right, okay. It's a tough one this. But I suppose that's why it's targeted as so. so I was sent in STEM, and this is always, I think when we've looked at these, this is always probably the most important part. It says, use information about the pathways followed by an nerve impulse to suggest an explanation for these observations. So the first thing would be to talk about the pathways followed by nerve impulses. So, um, <laughs> we've got to just think about a reflex arc and, and that makes this question a lot easier. So um, you'd be talking about things like a stimulus, receptor, sensory neuron, etc. And you'd obviously have to fill in the rest. Um, so basically, you, you know, this first part, use information about the pathways followed by nerve impulses, you're just describing a reflex arc. The second part is possibly the harder, okay, and that includes, it says, suggest an explanation for these observations, and really you've got to think about the person. Okay, so if she's tapped here, it works but she can't move her legs voluntarily. So that must mean, at some point, maybe around about here, that's where the spinal cord is severed or damaged. So what you can't then get is nerve impulses passing from the brain down. They won't work, but you can still get nerve impulses here because this would go to the spinal cord and back again. So not actually a bad question for an ASR, but it's interpreting these. And really, when you read this question stem, this bit, okay, like the key bit before you get onto the question, if you are not sure what to write, just, you know, here, use information about the pathways followed by nerve impulses. What I'd be doing there is just trying to explain everything I know about nerve impulses, and particularly reflex art, because it's on about reflexes. Um, here. Okay. Uh, next, staying on B6, um, this question is about the brain. Okay, so oxygen and glucose levels affect brain activity. Suggest why oxygen and glucose are needed by the neurons in the brain. Right, okay, so oxygen and glucose. Um, Put a tick in the box <coughs> next to the best science answer to bind to receptors in the synapses. Well, that's something else. To release energy for the transmission of impulses. Seems plausible because that would imply respiration. Avoid the build up of carbon dioxide in the neurons. Well, it's the blood that takes away carbon dioxide. And to allow the diffusion of transmitter substances across the synapse. Well, diffusion is a passive process, to require energy, so we can probably figure out which one of those it is. Um, 
The brain contains billions of synapses. It suggests why an impulse can only travel can travel in only one direction across the synapse. For this one, it's probably helpful to think of the synapse. And if you imagine neurotransmitters released from this side and they diffuse across and bind to receptors on that side. Um, so from those two things, having receptors on one side, chemicals diffusing from the other, you'll probably be able to figure that one out. Okay? It's a hard question, and the way you can tell that that says suggest. They're usually the questions that are most demanding. Again, now this is a massive amount of information. Um, what I do when you've when you've faced with this is just quickly actually have a look at what the question's asking and then we'll go back and read it in the context of the question. Okay. So in which trial or trials would reabsorption of serotonin be blocked? Okay, so, uh, and then explain your answer. So we'll go back to the information now. Uh, serotonin is a chemical release of synapses in the brain. Okay, yeah, we know that. Serotonin is released from the neuron. Serotonin allows the nerve to be transferred across the synapses. Serotonin is then reabsorbed into the first neuron so that it can be released again when the next impulse arrives. Okay, a new antidepressant drug, so we've done about this, um, possibly something similar to Prozac, stops the serotonin from being re reabsorbed into the first neuron. The average mean dose of the drug over five days, right, okay, so the mean dose of the drug over five days must be greater than 10 milligrams to cause this effect. A patient takes part in two trials, A and B. In trial A, the patient takes the drug each day for five days. After a rest period of one week, the patient starts trial B and again takes the drug for five days. The doses taken in trial A and trial B are shown in the tables. Okay, so... We've got two sets of results. Okay, so the question actually seems a fair, fair bit easier now. So in which trial or trials would reabsorption of serotonin be blocked? Explain your answer. Well, in this one, that's the number, that's the uh, amount per day. And remember, we're linking it back to this statement. And helpfully, they've bold it. And then we'd have a look at this one. So we can now explain which one it would be, and then uh, say which one it is B, and then you've got to explain this with two marks. So one for the statement, and one for the explanation. Um, and then it says, at the end of trial B, the transmission of nerve impulse across the patient's brain synapses increases. Just why? Um, well, we've got to link that back to serotonin, so maybe we're thinking about drawing a little diagram there if you're not sure. Uh, and remember, these would be blocks. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to think about what effect that would have on the concentration of serotonin on the effect. Uh, next one, it says, it may be possible to change the trials to increase the confidence in the data obtained. Put ticks in the boxes next to suggestions that would improve the trials. With two marks, so a reasonable assumption sometimes is two marks, two things. Not always. Um, but it, it is suggesting it's multiple ticks, boxes. Um, so carry out each trial for a shorter period of time. Carry out the trials using female patients only. Pair the drugs against placebo. Decrease the dose of the drug in the second trial. Give the participants, participants other drugs at the same time and use them on one patient. So this seems really straightforward. Um, a lot of these would actually decrease the confidence you want to the increase. 
Um, next, uh, a fun one. Scientists can map the regions of the human brain using different techniques. Uh, and it says, name one of these techniques and discuss the ethical issues associated with it. Um, so, we'd have to think of one. I mean, probably... I'd, I'd probably be choosing between one of two, um, and that is MRI, which we've done about an electrical stimulation using when the brain is open. So we've looked at both of these. So you choose one of those and suggest an ethical reason. You're probably going to get one mark for the technique and one mark for the ethical issue. Oh, blank page. Naughty. Save the environment. Um, the activity of enzymes is affected by temperature. Right, good, so we're in B4. We know where we're going to be with this one. The graph shows the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction involving the enzyme catalase. Okay, brilliant, so we've got a classic, classic graph. Um, first thing to do, not temperature. Um, 0 to 80, rate of reaction, fine. And we get in a pattern like this which is a classic pattern for enzyme activity. How many times greater is the rate of reaction at 30 degrees than the rate of reaction at 10 degrees? Um, with this one, the, the key thing is that you must measure really exactly on the line. Okay, so going up and making sure you get it at the point where it hits it exactly. And then you should have two values. Um, and then you should be work out how many times greater. Um, and these ones, I mean, this looks fairly straightforward. It looks like two, not point five. So I probably go with those and won't put in any decimal place. Um, next one: describe the pattern shown by the graph between forty degrees and eighty degrees. Well, that's that's straightforward. Um, although you probably want to say two things. So, um, from 40 to what about 70? It decreases. Okay, but make sure you just don't say it decreases. And then after 70, between 70 and 80. Bit reaction zero essentially. So you want to be explaining in, in in two two stages, even though it's only worth one mark. Um, and then use information on the graph and use your knowledge of enzymes to explain what's happening at temperatures higher than forty degrees. Now, three marks. Key thing with this one is you've got to get in your keywords. Okay, so we'd be talking about words like denatured, active site, and substrate. And if we can get in those, I think we're, we're absolutely fine for three marks really. Next one, data in the graph were obtained from a series of experiments. Okay. It is important to control all factors that might affect this type of enzyme other than the fact of being investigated. The fact of being investigated is temperature. State one factor that should be controlled in this experiment and explain how this factor affects the activity of enzymes. Well, we've only done about one other factor and that factor is pH. Okay, so 
that's what we're going to use and then just a quick explanation of what it does again using that denatured keyword Tom now he's investigating photosynthesis and respiration in plant leaves uh, and it's important to remember that plants do undergo respiration and photosynthesis um, he sets up the experiment shown in the diagram um, so we've got a leaf and this one's completely covered by foil then we've got a leaf just in a normal boiling tube um, and oh, sorry test tube and then we've got fabric mesh where it looks like it's kind of dashed so maybe letting into sunlight right now again we seem to have quite a lot of information here before they even get on to asking a question so the indicator solution is red at the start of the experiment in all three tubes the indicator will change colour if the level of carbon dioxide in any of the tubes changes the box summarises how the colour of the indicator will change so if it decreases it's purple. If it increases, it's yellow. So what would what would probably annotate it here, and I'd encourage you to do this when you're faced with so much information. Um, decreased level of carbon dioxide. Well, that happens when plants photosynthesize. Because they're taking CO2. Increased level of carbon dioxide, well, that's going to be through respiration. Now, if the two processes are roughly equal, it'll stay red. If respiration is higher than photosynthesis, it'll be yellow. And if respiration is um, lower than the rate of photosynthesis, it'll be purple. Uh, and here is his results table. Now they've filled in the one for red, and that's presumed because only some light would get through. So then you've just got to be able to think, right, well, would photosynthesis take place in tube air? Uh, probably suspect not. Would photosynthesis take place in tube A? Well, yes. And if the plant is photosynthesized effectively, then uh, what will happen is since this will be higher than the rate of respiration. Um, next one, explain why the indicator solution in tube C was still red after 24 hours. Right, okay, three marks for this as well, which is quite a lot. So we've got to think. Um, firstly, we've got to think the reason for that. Okay, so got the mesh and we we'll probably want to explain what the mesh does then we would want to explain the effect of that on photosynthesis and then just from red what's that mean about the rate of photosynthesis and the rate of respiration so we're taking this question and we're breaking it down Okay, and finally, what does that mean about CO2? So CO2 in that test tube, what does it mean if it stays red? It's actually quite a nice question, but you've got to really explain it step by step. Um, carbon dioxide and light can be limiting factors for photosynthesis. Write down one other limiting factor that Tom should control in his experiment. Well, we've done three limiting factors. Okay, there's one more. Um, Tom did the experiment with leaves from a plant that grows in bright sunlight. He repeated the experiment using leaves from a plant that grows in shaded conditions. This time the indicator solution in tube B changes more quickly. Okay. Suggest why. So shaded condition plants. Indicator solution in tube B changes colour more quickly. So, if it changes colour more quickly, that means we've got increased photosynthesis.
and then we'll have to think about why that might be. Why has it got an increased rate of fall since it's well? If it's in oh, if it's in lower light conditions, um, we we want to try and explain it. So, how do plants photosynthesize? So we'd probably want to be linking this to chloroplasts or chlorophyll. Okay. Next one, absolute gift. Look at questions like this. Okay, yeast is a microorganism. Can respire using aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Write a word equation for anaerobic respiration in yeast. And next one, and just make sure they're giving you big bold letters because they don't want you to make a mistake. This one is a symbol equation for aerobic respiration. Two marks. Um, diagram shows some structures in a yeast cell. Um, write down the structures labelled A and B. Well, B is this squiggly one. Yeah, that's fine. A, you just got to make sure it's pointing to this outer one, not the inner one, and that's important. Whoops. All right, and next. So our second six marker. Um, so scientists are investigating some properties of structures in a yeast cell. They're examining the process of aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. And the results are shown in the table. So we've got some organelles. Um, we've got cell membrane, cytoplasm, mitochondria, nucleus, and property. And then we've got several properties. And it says explain how the properties how the properties of these structures help the yeast cells to respire using aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. So um, with this one, I think the best way is since we've got four structures is to approach it one at a time. Okay, so we'll start with the cell membrane. Now it's already given us quite a lot of information, which is why this is a C grade question. So for cell membrane it says free permeability gases. So we'd be talking about oxygen and CO2 and making sure we link those to respiration. Um, then we talk about the cytoplasm. Um, mention the enzymes and their use. And probably particularly link it to anaerobic respiration because because anaerobic respiration takes place within the cytoplasm. Then again the mitochondria. Again would mention the enzymes and in this case we'd talk about aerobic respiration. And then probably the hardest one, the nucleus. So this is um, contains the genes. Okay, so we've got to think about why the genes are important, and, and this kind of more links to B five, and that is like production of proteins, or in particular enzymes needed in respiration. So although they may work in the cytoplasm and mitochondria, the code to produce them is in the nucleus. And now we do move on to B5. So we've got an embryo develops from a fertilized egg, zygos in animals. Scientists have shown that most embryo cells become specialized and form different types of tissue. Some cells remain unspecialized and are called embryonic stem cells. All the embryonic stem cells in a zygote are identical to one another. 
put in the tick in the box next to each correct statement. Each correct statement, two marks. Probably going to suggest there's going to be two of them. Um, so embryonic stem cells produced by mitosis can switch off any gene during development of the embryo. Yeah. Contain different genes to those found in the specialised cells. Well, what we often do here is try and look for ones that um, are wrong and different genes. All of our cells, pretty much, with the exception of gametes, contain and and red blood cells uh, contain the same genes and contain half the number of chromosomes. Well, again, that's only in gametes. So again, we're just going through a process of elimination when we find a question like that. Um, medical use of embryonic stem cells is regulated by the government. An embryo, an embryo is produced from a donor egg and a sperm. Stem cells from this embryo are injected into the patient. This procedure has ethical issues. Put a tick in the box next to each ethical issue. Um, worth two marks, but again, it's not necessarily an indication that that's how many uh, answers you'll be ticking. Um, so patient will contain DNA from another person. Well, yeah, that, that's ethical. Okay, there's, you, some people might agree that that's wrong. Embryonic stem cells may be larger than the patient cells. Well, that just sounds like nonsense. Who cares? Donated embryonic stem cells may be rejected by the patient's body. Well, that makes perfect sense, but it's an ethical issue. Embryos may be destroyed. Well, I think straight away we're going to know that that one, if we're talking about destroying embryos, I'm talking about destroying life, potentially. It's got to be an ethical issue. Scientists and doctors must decide who receives the embryonic stem cells. Again, potentially. This, this one's maybe the one I'm least sure of. Um, and the donated embryonic stem cells may not survive in the body of the patient. It's more of a scientific thing. It's not really about ethical issues. So I think we can probably go with those three. Third one, we're not sure of, but it seems reasonable. And because there's so many choices, six, three would be a reasonable number. Um, next one, the growth and development of each cell in the embryo is controlled by its DNA. What are the features of DNA? Complete the table. Put a ring around the correct box in each row. So you've got to make sure you read it carefully and a row goes across. So you'll put one in this one, one in this one, one in this one, one in this one. Again, it's quite a lot for one mark. Um, Use your knowledge of the genetic code to explain where and how proteins are coded for and made. Um, quite a nice question. Um, there's not a lot in the question seven that's going to kind of confuse you. So, where and how proteins are coded for and made. So we're looking for coded for. So. We're going to be talking about DNA and made. Well, we're going to be talking about mRNA and ribosomes. Okay, and then we'll be definitely mentioning other keywords. So, other keywords are things like bases, complementary. triplets um, amino acids um, and if we mention about DNA we'll also mention things like double helix um, and T, G and C etc Okay, just to make sure we're hitting as many of the marking points as possible. And that's one of the things with these questions, it's with these simple, quite straightforward questions, it's exhausting everything you know, right? Just give them everything I know about DNA 
and then describe how it links to actual protein synthesis. Okay, uh, and we move on to Ruth. wants to develop a model of how plants grow in a garden. <laughs> Why? Um, she uses four trays of crest seedlings. There are 100 seedlings in each tray. I'll tell you what, since there seems to be a massive amount of information here, again, I'm going to look um, at what the question is asking to explain the results of the crest seedlings grown in box A. So I'm going to take special attention to this. Use your knowledge of orcs in distribution in your answer. Okay, so back to the top. So she's got four trays, 100 scenes in each tray, all the scenes are approximately two centimetres tall, two trays in A, and that's a bright light above it, two trays in B, bright light on one side of it. Ruth recalls the appearance of the scenes after 24 hours and again after 48 hours. She sees that some of the scenes have grown with a straight stem, but others have grown with a curved stem. Okay, so. Um, if we have a look, box there, well, very few grow with a curved stem. So, if we're talking in terms of auxin, what we've got to think about is, where is the auxin going to be? Is it going to go down one side, side of the plant, the other side of the plant, or is it going to be evenly distributed? And what would be the effect of auxin? So we're not just describing our answers, we're trying to explain it, because it does ask us to explain. Um, then, after 48 hours, Ruth changes the position of the trays in box B. So after the experiment's gone to 48 hours, she changes the position. She places the tray so the curved seedlings are facing away from the light source. Suggest what will happen to the seedlings and explain why. Use your knowledge of auxin distribution and your answer. Well, we'd expect them to curve, but perhaps in another way. And again, we're trying to explain that in terms of auxin, so we're talking about like a dark side key terms to get in with auxin is cell elongation because that's what actually causes it to curve Does Ruth's experiment accurately represent how plants would grow in a garden? Give two reasons to support your answer Right, interesting um, so does it accurately represent how plants would grow in a garden? Well, probably not. Um, and we've just got to think of as many reasons as possible with this. Um, I, if, if you are not sure, it's going to get a mark. Put another reason as well. So, firstly I think about the position of light. So does the way she's represented it accurately reflect it? Um, I'd think about the plants. So she's using small crests. Um, think about the time, that's another factor. And it's quite a simple question. It's wanting simple reasons essentially. Um, I'd even, you know, you, even think about things like shade and temperature, etc. All all the things that could that could be different outdoors to indoors. Okay, so it's a really simple question. Just wanted simple answers. Okay, and that's the end of that one.